Hi, I'm Audra Parker. I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks also to the Osterville Anglers Club for sponsoring tonight's event. So for those of you who don't know us, um, the Alliance is a nonprofit environmental organization. We're based in Hyannis on Cape Cod, and we are dedicated to the long-term preservation of Nantucket Sound. And we're excited to continue our ACONS or celebration of Nantucket Sound series tonight with a discussion of fishing and fish in Nantucket Sound. So um, ACONS or a celebration of Nantucket Sound is a webinar series and each month we feature an expert discussing some aspect of Nantucket Sound, rich history, either from a maritime or tribal perspective, its contribution to the economy or its uh, unique habitat. So by doing that, we hope to provide you with an in-depth view of Nantucket Sound and why it's such a special and unique body of water. So let me, before I introduce our speaker, um, just a little bit about our work. So the Alliance is seeking, along with a wide and diverse group of stakeholders, to enact a federal law called the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act that would accomplish three very important things to protect and preserve Nantucket Sound. First of all, it would recognize Nantucket Sound rich tribal and maritime history by designating the sound as a national historic landmark. And just to give you an example of what that is, um, the whole island of Nantucket is a national historic landmark, as is the Kennedy Compound in Hyannisport and Wesleyan Grove in Oak Bluffs on the vineyard. So it's the highest level of historic protection possible. Secondly, the act would improve the consistency between state law and federal law. And hopefully I'll have a map up here shortly to show you why, why that is important. There you go. So essentially, if you look at Nantucket Sound, the light blue waters that extend out three miles from the shoreline of Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket are controlled by the state and are in fact protected under a law called the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act. While the federal waters in the center of Nantucket Sound are unprotected, and if we are successful with enactment of the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act, it will improve the consistency and the protections between state and federal waters. So first, designation as a National Historic Landmark. Secondly, improving consistency between state and federal waters. And third, and very important, is to provide significant environmental benefits by addressing other threats that are facing Nantucket Sound today, such as diminished water quality, algae blooms along the shorelines, habitat degradation, coastal erosion, and, and other, other effects of climate change. Um, so moving forward, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a wide group of supporters. We have uh, municipalities along the Cape and Islands um, facing Nantucket Sound. We have commercial fishing groups, environmental groups, tribal entities, navigational interests, renewable energy developers. So it's really a, a wide, strong, and diverse coalition of stakeholders that are working to enact um, this, this special important piece of legislation. So with that, um, again, thank you for joining us and I'm excited to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Randall Sherman and he's the vice president of the Cape Cod Salty Sport Fishing Club, chairman of the Cape Cod Salties Foundation, a lifelong resident of Cape Cod and a retired firefighter. Um, the Cape Cod Salties advocates for the marine environment, helps clean out valuable herring runs and does beach cleanups um, in the canal and along our um, Cape, Cape beaches. The Cape Cod Salties Foundation, which is relatively new, raises funds for scholarships and marine enhancement projects, um, such as the Yarmouth Fishing Reef, which is located two miles south of the mouth of Bass River. And for this webinar, Randall will discuss fish and fishing in Nantucket Sound. So with that, I am hoping that he will join us. So Randall, can you unmute and? I'm unmuted. That's great. Well, I can hear you, which is wonderful. Um, I don't know if, I, if I'm if i able to, I can't see you now. I don't know if your video is working, but at least we can hear you. No, that did not work tonight. It worked fine last night. So 
I don't know which end that's on, but okay. Well, that's okay. At least we can, at least we can um, hear you. So I think that's a that's a bit more important. So just um, logistics for the audience. We have video capacities off, so you'll only see me and Randall. Um, and at the end, we'll finish with the Q and A Q &A session so that you can um, put through the chat function. You can submit questions th throughout. And at the end, I'll come back and facilitate a Q and A with Randall. So with that, I will um, get off the screen and you should be seeing a slide presentation at least while you're hearing Randall's voice. So um, welcome and, and thank you. Okay, Peter, if you can uh, start the slides. Okay, uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, Cape Cod Salties uh, promote and encourage interest in saltwater sport fishing, opportunities for those interested. Uh, we foster sound conservation practices and laws, good sportsmanship. This is right out of our bylaws here, but also we have monthly meetings, which we are now back to in-person meetings uh, every month on the uh, fourth Wednesday of the month, with the exception of the holiday weeks later in the year. Uh, at the Yarmouth Senior Center on Forest Road in South Yarmouth. And we are meeting uh, next week and anyone's uh, welcome to be a guest. Anyone's also welcome to join. We, with our monthly meetings, we do a brief business meeting for either the uh, Sport Fishing Club, the foundation or both. But we also have speakers, uh, charter captains, scientists, manufacturers of fishing gear, uh, advocacy on behalf of marine resources. We participate as a sport fishing club in the legislative process, both uh, state and uh, federal uh, in testifying and providing input on regulations and statutes in supporting the health of the fisheries. We sponsor group fishing trips, learn to fish programs, and obviously the sharing of information. I do wanna thank the Austerville Anglers Club for their sponsorship of tonight's event. And also uh, thank uh, Abigail Archer or Barnstable County Extension for the work she did on this uh, slide portion of this presentation and helping us put these together. Next slide. And when we're talking about uh, sport fishing in Nantucket Sound and commercial fishing, this is the uh, this is at Bass River Beach. It's the fishing dock, combination of uh, state funds and local. And this is just an example. Uh, you're looking across at West Ennis Beach from the mouth of Bass River. Just an example of uh, the importance of Nantucket Sound to a lot of people. This is an event that was held a year ago, or two years ago in June, uh, sponsored by Riverview Bait and Tackle. It was a learn to fish day. Uh, with the help of the Cape Cod Salties, um, and just a, a sample of some of the things uh, that occurs. Uh, next slide. The Salties, uh, as a group, uh, many of our members participate with uh, Kimberly Fine from the Massachusetts Department of Marine Fisheries in its uh, Sportfish Angler Data Collection. What we do. If we look at the next slide, is uh, when we are fishing recreationally, it can be done commercially as well, but whether you're keeping a fish or you're doing catch and release, we do a quick uh, scale sampling. And these are just pictures of the instructions. We have these little uh, envelopes and a pencil on board the boat. If it's a fish that we're going to keep uh, that's uh, legal size for harvest and we choose to do that, we can uh, do the scale sample uh, after the fishing day is done. If it's something we're going to release, we set up ahead of time, we set up a uh, wet towel, do a very quick measurement and get some scales, get them in the envelope, then we fill out the envelope later. Uh, but all of this goes back to, uh, to Kimberly and the science begins where they get all kinds of information from the scale samples. They can determine the age and we give them a general idea of where the fish was caught. 
we may say Nantucket Sound, you may say Cape Cod Bay, you may say somewhere else. You don't have to give them your secrets, but anybody can participate in this uh, by contacting them. But uh, we have been doing this for a number of years as have others, and we have provided a great deal of uh, data for them to use, which helps with establishing appropriate regulations for the protection of the resource, which is a big part of what the salty support. Next. When we talk about Nantucket Sound and we talk about all of the fisheries there, you got to, the fisheries, everything starts obviously at the very basic level and the fish need something to eat. And on Nantucket Sound, there are at least now 16 active herring runs between the south of Cape Cod and on Nantucket. Uh, next slide. And obviously they're part of the uh, serious part of the food chain, oh, one back, part of the food chain, but herring uh, eat zooplankton, they also eat algae. And once they're approximately three years old, they come back to our rivers, to our estuaries, to our herring runs. They travel up in the spring. We've had them traveling up uh, often as early as early March, uh, going up into the ponds. Uh, all over the Cape. I'll show you some of the locations momentarily. But they, uh, they spawn in the fresh water. They are andromedous, which means they live in both salt and fresh water. Uh, they spawn and then within a couple months, and we saw it this year as early as mid-July, the fry, the baby herring are heading back to the ocean. Spend three years there and come back to right where they were born to continue the process. And they have a lot of the fish, a lot of the game fish that people like for recreational and commercial fishing. Herring is a big part of their diet, along with many other things, of course. But it's very important that these herring runs uh, be maintained and be supported. And when you're dealing with herring, we get tremendous support. Association for the Preservation of Cape Cod coordinates a uh, accounting program that the Salties participate in, but it's a statewide effort. Uh, herring have been restricted from uh, recreational take for a number of years now because they have been challenged. Uh, recent legislation moved the very large herring trawlers out 12 to 25 miles away from our shore so that there would be food here for all of the uh, game fish and birds and uh, other animals. Uh, Looking, yep, yeah, good timing. No, go ahead, next slide. This is just an example where you see the red marks and you see the estuaries and the rivers. Uh, there's five uh, of the places where you do have uh, herring runs along the south side, next slide. And there's a few more. We have one in Yarmouth that we work on extensively. We have members who participate in the counting programs in Sandwich and Howich and, and other locations. Uh, next slide. This is just an example of the clean out that gets done in the spring to make sure that the herring have full passage to get up the herring run. This is the Cape Cod Salties. It usually takes uh, two partial days, group of volunteers, this happens to be a Swan Pond to Long Pond in Yarmouth herring run. And there's others where we have worked. We worked many years on a Dennis Heron run with uh, that town. Um, and there are other members working with other towns. Uh, the State Department of Marine Fisheries has enhanced fish ladders. The Yarmouth Department of Natural Resources uh, and the DPW has worked with us. There's been an awful lot of maintenance. And this year, those people who drive down Route 28 in uh, West Yarmouth noticed a complete rebuild of the Baxter Mill. And part of that was a brand new fish ladder, which will open up another herring run uh, to the ocean and uh, to the pond. So uh, again, they're part of the uh, food chain and they're important to Nantucket. Next slide. You can see just a few of the red dots on Nantucket, but there's, there's five listed herring runs on that side of Nantucket Sound. Next slide. 
And how can you help River Heron and Nantucket Sound? Uh, there's counting programs in most of the towns in the spring where you count for a 10 minute period and multiple people do it during the course of uh, each day from March 1st to May 31st, I believe. Uh, and we work with APCC to uh, collect and data enter the uh, information. We take uh, kids and visitors and people who live here, take them to see the various heron runs. Obviously the one in Brewster is one of the most popular. Excuse me for a moment. You can help with uh, late winter, early spring herring run cleanups. Next slide. Okay, and then the things we're talking about is fishing, recreational and commercial fishing in Nantucket Sound. And this is a result as people on their, you know, recreational boats, take the kids out, take yourselves out, you have a wonderful day on the water. Uh, when you're talking about uh, shore fishing, the Cape Cod shore all along Nantucket Sound from Monomoy to Nantucket to the vineyard. Every time of year, spring, summer, fall, beaches, jetties, rivers, bridges. Uh, for example, Pompanasset Beach is one of the earlier places for uh, stripers or bluefish in the spring. West Ennis Beach becomes very popular for, for both uh, May into June. Uh, your best advice in terms of shore fishing and as well as boats. Your best advice is your many local tackle shops. Uh, there are tackle shops in every one of your communities. Uh, up-to-date information, local tackle, what are people using, what works. They hear from people who fish every day and they're willing to share that information with people who want to go fishing. If you look in your town and you look on the chart of Nantucket Sound, you will see, you know, where anywhere where rivers or estuaries enter the sound, anywhere that there's a jetty. Um, these can all be potential shore fishing sites depending on the time of year. There's also uh, organizations and people who put out uh, weekly video education. There's a subscription service to, known as My Fishing Cape Cod with tremendous uh, fishing information and uploaded videos. Uh, they even have recipes. Uh, Goose Hummock Shop, a big tackle shop in Orleans, has a weekly video update you can sign up for. On the Water Magazine has its TV shows, YouTube, uh, and also the magazine itself and the Fisherman Magazine. But in terms of uh, our fish, fishing information. When you're talking about commercial fishing, which is, uh, again, I don't have a, a picture of commercial fishing in and of itself, but we view commercial fishing two different ways. You have the people who make a living uh, gathering fish and running it through the fish markets and uh, supplying the restaurants and what have you. You're, uh, your best connection is probably the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance out of Chatham. Uh, but you're looking at some of the commercial fishing that we know that takes place in Nantucket Sound uh, is squid fishing in the spring. You can see some of the bigger boats out there. Uh, it's a very popular fishery. There is an older fishery, uh, pot fishermen, which is a uh, you know, similar to the lobster pots, but they're modified and they're used for catching certain bottom fish. And there's a historical fishery that's been done in Nantucket Sound uh, for, you know, for as long as there's been people here, and that's the weir fishery. And to the best of my knowledge, that's still taking place uh, off of Howitch and Chatham. Um, I know it was just a few years ago when I was out that way. Uh, where it's a series of uh, wooden poles made, a, made out of trees, um, you know, stripped of bark and placed in the water and with nets to create a maze and the fish go into the maze, can't get out. People go out with the boats and go uh, collect the fish. That is a very historical commercial fishery that has still been being done uh, in that. When you're talking about recreational, okay, yeah, that you can stop on that slide for a minute if you would like. 
This is just an example. Uh, there's Lua, you can see Lewis Bay, Topaka's Neck, to Bass River. Actually, it wouldn't be bad right now, uh, Peter, if we uh, had the view in Nantucket Sound. We're gonna try a different picture, folks, so we can see Nantucket Sound and reference a few things. There we go. You're looking at Nantucket Sound when you're looking, uh, as you look at the screen, you're looking from like Handkerchief Shoal, which is just west of the tip of Monomoy. I think he's putting an arrow on there for you, but just west of the tip of Monomoy is a Handkerchief Shoal. And just off of Barnstable, Hyannis to Centerville is Horseshoe Shoal. You look and then Tucker Neck is out closer to Nantucket. But you look at all these different areas and you're looking at areas where you have the differences in depth and differences in structure. A lot of Nantucket Sound is a flat sandy bottom, but every place where you see the different colorations here, and when you look closer at the chart, any place that you see the differences in depth, you have structure, you have rocks versus sand, you might have mud, you might have some other structure. Uh, you have a potential for an excellent place uh, for fish to be certain times a year as they migrate and move through the area. But Nantucket Sound has, we could spend all day just looking at the chart, but this is just a general view. You can't really see specifically, but just giving you an idea that any place where there's structure, any place where there's a change in depth, you have the potential for some good recreational or commercial fishing depending on what you're doing. Okay, we can go back to the other slides. Okay, next. Next slide. Well, uh, while Peter works on getting the next slide up, I will just uh, continue. Hang on a minute, got all my notes here. When we talk about boats, you need access, and access is via boat ramps. And in many of the municipalities, if you look where the rivers hit the Nantucket Sound and up and down the rivers, there are boat ramps. Uh, Uh, Peter, I only see the, the one slide at the moment uh, of, of uh, one of the kids on a boat. Anyway, for boats, recreational and or commercial, access is one of the number one issues as you deal with Nantucket Sound. And access is via your boat ramps. And for example, uh, where Bass River hits the ocean, uh, Saquatucket Harbor. Uh, He's working on it, Randall. I know. I know. Sorry, I don't know what's what's yeah, happening here. Hopefully, to me, but that's okay. Yeah, just uh, keep talking. But access, so you look at Saquatucket Harbor with a, a good sized boat ramp and a lot of parking. You look at the Bass River Beach, um, you know, in every one of these towns and up and down the rivers, there are various places for access. The biggest thing is you have to have a place to park, a tow vehicle. There. Yeah. Now we have a slide showing, uh, showing the parking lot at Bass River Beach, a place for parking a truck and trailer or a tow vehicle and trailer for your recreational or commercial boats. This one happens to be a little large. The others are smaller. There we go. Peter, looks like things are working. Okay, back up right there. No, back up one, the boat ramp. Okay, there's the example of a double wide boat ramp of which there are quite a few on the Cape and on the South Shore. Uh, and that, that'll work very well. 
recreational private boats, commercial boats, access to the water is key. We're gonna talk about another structure here. Okay, next slide. Okay, there's just an example when we're talking about recreational boats, you've got a smaller boat, maybe 16 feet in the, in the forefront of the picture. You've got a larger boat, probably around 23 feet. Uh, these happen to be at a marina, but they just as easily could have come off a of trailer. I was in uh, Bass River with my 20 foot boat on Sunday, uh, just going up and down the river, having a picnic with family. And I must have seen something north of 500 boats moving during the course of the day, just in that one river, in and out to Nantucket Sound, into the river, pulling up in places for beaches, people upriver uh, fishing inside, outside, uh, but access. All of these rivers and estuaries uh, when you're dealing with the recreational private boats, but different fishing areas. We talked about the Horseshoe Shoal and Handkerchief. Uh, Bishop and Clerks is off Hyannis, is a rocky area. It's very popular with recreational boats and the other part of commercial boating, the Fahaya vessels, which I'll get into in a moment. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is more of a classic bass boat. Uh, a number of people do use those for the uh, for higher vessels known as six packs. Next slide. And there's a typical size for a six pack charter boat. You know, the captain has a license where he can take six customers and himself and his mate, and take you out for a half day or a full day of fishing uh, anywhere in the sound or beyond. And uh, every place that they have access uh, to Nantucket Sound, they're able to get out. And if you want to learn where to fish, how to fish, what to use, uh, taking the time to take a charter with these charter boat captains out of all of these harbors, uh, Sacquatucket, Wichmere Harbor, Allen Harbor, there's three marinas in Bash River, there's the Hyannis Marina, which of course is huge. And then you've got the, the uh, Oyster Harbors Marine all the way up and down the coast. Uh, you have access. Next slide. Okay. This is uh, showing, this is a fisherman who's caught a fluke, a very nice fluke, by the way, on a six pack charter boat. Next slide. The other boats you're dealing with are your, what we refer to as head boats or your larger vessels. Uh, the captains have a different license. And those boats are sized to take anywhere from 20 to 60 people at a time out into Nantucket Sound or beyond. This particular boat that this picture was taken on is a uh, nearly a hundred footer out of Hyannis known as the Helen H. They've got a fleet uh, that goes all the way to Nantucket Shoals, but they have other boats that go right out into Nantucket Sound for a half day, a full day of fishing in some of those various locations we talked about before. It's a very nice way and a very cost-effective way of learning about Nantucket Sound and uh, you know finding different methods of fishing, different types of fish. This is another fluke. Uh, next slide. Take the family with you. It's a big part of what fishing and access to Nantucket Sound is about. Here we're talking about a hundred foot boat, but another part of uh, recreational fishing in Nantucket Sound goes all the way down to fishing out of a kayak in the near shore areas. They're very effective at getting uh, in and around some shore structure and going out a little ways, properly equipped. It's becoming very, very popular. And this uh, again is the uh, hundred foot boat, the Helen H. And this is a Cape Cod Salty uh, on the left and I believe his daughter. And on the last uh, group fishing trip that we took, she beat everybody on the boat. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, uh, different methods were being used all the way around the boat. Everyone had a good time and everyone was able to bring home some quality, uh, quality fish. Next slide. Okay, uh, Peter, can we go to the uh, slides that deal with the uh, 
the chart that deals with the fishing reef. While he's getting that slide, uh, no, that's Nantucket Sound itself. We're talking the chat that's on the slideshow. The uh, smaller graphic, it's one of the slides. While he's uh, bringing that up, let's see if it's up or down. I think it's up, there we go. Number 14, there we go. As uh, Audra said earlier, 2.2 miles south of Bass River is what's known as the Armataya Reef. And if you look on some of your current charts, in fact, I have one right here in front of me, it's listed as, a, as an obstruction, a fish haven. <laughs> Depends on the chart and who did the chart, how it's labeled. But it's been in place for over 40 years. Um, it started with, with tires that were banded together and cemented. And those tires uh, are still there and they've still provided structure in an area that was a flat sandy bottom. It's been a dense destination for people to fish for over 40 years. And uh, a number of years ago, many of you will recall, the Howitch High School was being replaced. And what they did was they built in to the uh, program for a place in the Howitch High School that the concrete and brick and steel would be utilized for making an artificial reef off of Howitch. And here we are talking about the Yarmouth artificial reef. We're gonna talk about both of them. The uh, Director of uh, Department of Natural Resources, Town of Yarmouth, Carl Von Holm and the Howitch Harbor Masters worked together to get 10 year renewable permits for creating and enhancing the two fishing reefs. What was gonna be the new Howitch High School reef off of Howitch, a 10 acre site and the existing 125 acre Yarmouth Tire Reef site. Very uh, forward thinking on their parts because you're dealing with state and federal permits. Uh, and what they accomplished was as the Bass River Railroad Bridge got taken down, the Cape Cod Salties got involved. And we can go to the next slide. Cape Cod Salties got involved and uh, had the towns of Dennis and the towns of Yarmouth donated through the Cape Cod Salties, all the granite that came out of the Bass River Railroad Bridge as that was opened up and widened up to improve the water flow in the upper part of the river to improve the water quality. All that granite got donated through the Salties to the Department of Marine Fisheries. Working with Mark Russo, the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries, he did all of the permitting and grant writing, bidding and coordination. Uh, and we we're able to deploy three barge loads, three barge loads of granite and concrete uh, to the Amataya Reef site in one anchor sections to start enhancing that reef. In addition, the Coast Guard heard about what we were doing and gave us a call, they have no place to properly, without great expense, dispose of marine buoy anchors, 1,000 pound concrete blocks and 4,000 pound concrete blocks after they've out used their lifespan for holding the ocean buoys. So an over 200 foot uh, buoy tender and another 49 foot buoy tender are now doing regular deployments to the Yamataya Reef site in one acre spots of 1,000 pound and 4,000 pound anchors to enhance that fishery. Uh, DMF is uh, dove on the fishery. I wanna show the sl next slide, please. This is the kind of fish you're dealing with in Nantucket Sound. We've, you've heard me talk about bluefish and stripers. We've seen fluke. Uh, doing this, this here is a picture of part of the science the Cape Cod Salties helped support by providing boats for the interns from Northeastern working through the Division of Marine Fisheries 
They put out base stations on existing reef sites, on existing natural site, Bishop and Clerks, and then on wide open flat sandy bottom. And they would, the camera would take video for a specified period of time, then we'd retrieve the camera. What you're seeing here is black sea bass, scup, and tudog uh, in Nantucket Sound at one of the bait sites. We've also seen sharks and other fish in these videos. This is just one example. But when you have structure in the water, it, the entire food chain starts up. You end up with the, the green stuff and the algae working, and then you have the minnows, and then you have fish like this, and then you have uh, game fish, which some of these are as well. Okay, now we can go farther down on the slides. Okay, right there. Um, you can stop right there for a moment. So people had asked, the fish available in Nantucket Sound, I'm sure there's more fish than I'm gonna list here, but the, uh, you know, you got striped bass, bluefish, scup, black sea bass, blackfish, tudog, that's two names for the same fish, the fluke, your sea robins, bonito and false albacore. In the fall, two members of the tuna family which are recreational fish. Uh, the bonito are very edible and the albacore are not, but they look very much alike. You need to learn the differences, but they are a total blast to catch. You can catch them on uh, light tackle, some places from shore, mostly from boats, and uh, they really can run. So they, people go, I've seen a lot of people even out catching them uh, kayak fishing, particularly like off of, uh, off of Centerville, for example. Those are some of the brown sharks people have caught from shore in Nantucket Sound. Economic value of Nantucket Sound, uh, you know, I'm sure somebody could uh, put a value to it, but when you think about how many marinas we have on the south side of Cape Cod and out on Nantucket and on this side of Martha's Vineyard, Every mariner, employment, sale of boats, repair and sale of motors, fishing tackle, all of your uh, tackle shops, the Cape is loaded with them. A couple of years ago, we identified over 800 businesses on Cape Cod uh, related to the water. And obviously a fair percentage related to Nantucket Sound. There is the rental and use of slips, the rental and use of boats. There's a lot of waiting lists for slips and moorings. The towns have marinas, the towns have mooring fields, all of it for access uh, to Nantucket Sound and to the water. There's high rack storage, which has helped uh, uh, small and moderately sized um, boats for private boat owners and or excuse me, and or for hire vessels. There is the slips that are provided for emergency responders, which give access to Nantucket Sound for your safety, provided either in municipal slips or by these various marinas very generously. And then you think about all the motels, cottages, restaurants, fuel, bait, and tackle. Uh, Audra, do we have any questions? We do have questions. We have a number of them. So thank you for that. That was great. Um, all right, first question from Ted is, if a new herring run is opened, how do the herring find it to start the cycle? I couldn't tell you, but I know they do. They, uh, <laughs> they just repaired and fixed a herring run. I'll tell you who could tell us that probably is Abigail Archer from uh, Bonstable County Extension Service, but... Uh, is that they they do find it's the fresh water that flows into Nantucket Sound from you know from the pond down the creek uh, down the run uh, to the ocean and if a herring run has been blocked and gets opened up again they find they find their way uh, and I don't know how and I don't know why but uh, 
you're dealing with, you know, uh, not a huge length of a life cycle, but they are out in the ocean for at least three years before they return. But we're talking, uh, I know the one in Plymouth they were dealing with, it had been blocked for a number of years. And they got it opened up, got it rebuilt, dealt with the fish ladders they needed and what have you. And within a year, they had herring back. Wow. So That's if impressive. it's fresh water, fresh water flowing into salt, they will find a way. Okay. Um, a second question from an anonymous attendee is, what is the impact of algae blooms on fishing in Nantucket Sound? The only one, not necessarily algae, uh, but everybody probably has heard the term of red tide, which is a specific algae, but uh, very seldom in the past 20 years have I heard that reported over on the Nantucket Sound side. They have had some of that in the Nauset Marsh area in a number of seasons, um, but we're hearing more about things like that in ponds themselves versus in the salt water. Uh, yeah, Randall, I actually saw a study and, and had some, you know, anecdotal reports of algae blooms along the Cape Cod shoreline of Nantucket Sound going from, you know, Falmouth up to Chatham. Right. So it can happen. And I know that yeah. with a lower oxygen issue uh, in, let's see, the southwest corner of Cape Cod Bay, as we speak, that was something we just saw in the last uh, couple of weeks. Right, affecting the lobsters. <laughs> slightly lower oxygenation level, just something to watch out for. And then that affects, you know, algae is part of what can affect that. Obviously, if there's too much algae growth, one of the uh, negative side effects is the reduction in the oxygen level in the water, which can affect obviously any of the uh, uh, marine life. Right. You know, both shellfish and swimming. Yeah. Another question, how much of an impact or how impactful are invasive species of fish in Nantucket Sound's waters? Well, I don't know that I'm uh, qualified to answer that specifically, but what I do know is during our current lifetimes, we are seeing fish, uh, fish types in our waters in Nantucket Sound and in and around the Cape that were always known to be Southern fish before. And for example, a good friend of mine just caught, uh, not so much in Nantucket Sound, but just south of there, just caught a very large uh, wahoo, which everyone thinks of. And if you look it up, it thinks of as a southern fish, but it comes out of the Gulf Stream. We're seeing more and more fish that normally were, were not up this far north. We are seeing them uh, not only in Nantucket Sound, but Cape Cod Bay and north of Boston fish that were never there, you know, for the, say the first, I'm 69 years old for the first 40, 50 years of my life, you never saw or heard about those kind of fish. And now we're hearing about them on a regular basis. Uh, in terms of invasive, normally I think of that as where somebody illegally put some fish into a certain pond or something that didn't belong there. Uh, in terms of the salt water, that the same thing could happen. Uh, I'm just not qualified to answer that from an invasive point of view, just that we are seeing different species of fish, uh, fish that usually were way south of here being part of our New England fisheries now, uh, very common. So I'm gonna follow this up with what hopefully is a very easy question for you. What's the best fish to eat this time of year? My favorite is fluke. You can, you can cook it so many different ways, but again, it's everybody's personal choice. Black sea bass is excellent. People can do wonderful things with striper, uh, smoked bluefish. Uh, you know, pe people can do things with everything. Uh, the fella from My Fish in Cape Cod just recently was eating, uh, uh, there's some good recipes actually for skate wings. And he was uh, doing uh, part of the sides of, uh, sea robins. So things you don't think are edible can be very edible, properly prepared. Interesting. Um, a question from Seal says, what's the depth of Nantucket Sound? Example off Harding's Beach, where are the deepest parts, shallow parts? 
and are they still weir fishing? To the best of my knowledge, they're still mm -hmm. weir fishing, but I, I haven't been out there uh, this year for a number of other reasons. In terms of off of Harding Beach, you bear with me for a minute, but you're off of Harding Beach, it goes out, it's shallows eight feet or so. And then if you look what is labeled on your chart, Chatham Roads, it goes down to 28, 27, 28 feet, 32 feet, the farther you go out away from Harding Beach. Up near the beach itself, maybe eight to 15 feet. So within Nantucket Sound itself, what, what, is the, what is the range, shallowest and deepest, would you say? Well, you've got over 40, over 40 feet in some areas. And of course, shallow is, is you can see the sandbars right. <laughs> when it's right. shallow, especially, you know, off Chatham, off the Monomoy side, Nantucket side of Monomoy, uh, Horseshoe Shoal yep. comes out of the water at the lower tides. Uh, and yet, uh, for example, where that Yarmouth uh, Tire Fishing Reef is, that's about 34 feet deep. Uh, but as you look, uh, handkerchief shoals, it comes up to two feet, four feet, and then quickly goes down. I see some numbers here, 48, 49 feet, just off handkerchief shoal. So tremendous variety in other words. Okay, and uh, another question. Um, what impact would development or specifically wind turbines towers have on fishing? Well, number one, they're not being built in Nantucket Sound. Thankfully, uh, yes. If he's talking about them in general terms, the base of a wind tower actually becomes structure. If you look at the fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where there's been oil rigs for as long as most of us have been alive, those are actually uh, very attractive spots for fish, just like when we're putting granite in the water here. Uh, the base can become an area that can be attractive and they're finding that right now in those five wind towers that were placed off Block Island. It has become a recreational fishing destination uh, after a couple of years with the same thing as what's happening with the uh, artificial reefs with the appropriate material that we're allowed to put in now. But uh, you know, I know that, um, I know that uh, when we um, have spoken and worked with a lot of commercial fishing organizations in the past, and also looking at studies that have come out of Europe, my understanding was that some species of fish are, as you describe, attracted to artificial structures, and yet some are repelled. Correct. So there's changes to the ecosystem that, you know, that are potentially problematic. And I know that was one, right. of, the, one of the issues from the fishing community. That's correct. And also, you know, you're looking at access, uh, you're looking at depending on quantity. I mean, right. you've already dealt and addressed all of that in terms of Nantucket Sound, but now, you know, they're getting uh, vineyard wind uh, on the other side of the vineyard in much deeper water, much farther away from shore. You're talking an interaction with commercial larger boat fisheries out that way. And they have had quite a bit of communications in terms of location uh, planning on those, on those particular structures out on the other side of the vineyard, uh, out and away from where a lot of people might access fisheries, but they've been trying to position them, is my understanding from everything that we have read, uh, so they interfere a minimum amount with existing good commercial fishing grounds. Uh, but that's an issue for those people that are involved in that and know a great deal more than we do, but it's something that we do read about, we have testified about, uh, we have listened a great deal about. Uh, so there's, there's impacts both ways, obviously. Uh, the trenching, uh, when it occurs, is relatively narrow, but it is a disruption uh, for the cabling. And there's a question of whether that uh, disrupts any fisheries, you know, afterwards. So um, here's, here's a question from Sandy that you may not want to answer, but <laughs> it is, where is your secret fishing spot on Nantucket Sound? You tell well, us it won't be secret any longer, but. No, it's, the, in terms of Nantucket Sound, uh, the places that I've fished, that, 
the uh, the Yamataya reef in terms of being able to take the kids out, take somebody out and be able to catch fish, learn how to fish. Uh, you know, of course, it's very accessible. I live in Yarmouth. Bass River Beach boat ramp is right there. Uh, that that is a destination. But also, when I've gone out on the, on the charter boats, the uh, that handkerchief shoal, uh, the area just west of Monomoy in Nantucket Sound, they're very productive, obviously for stripers, bluefish, and now something that. I wasn't aware occurred years back. They are catching fluke and black sea bass in that area, uh, in that area as well this year. And I've been reading that in the fishing reports. Somebody is asking, how deep is the water naturally around the artificial reef? The water around that particular, the uh, Yarmouth Reef, it runs about 34 to 37 feet. Um, and the minimum requirement for any material put on there have to maintain no less than 25 feet of depth to the material that's put there. Okay. Uh, but the general area is, you know, 30 to 35 feet deep. Okay. Um, another question references um, the, this attendee saw a seal in Edgartown Harbor last week and is wondering, are more seals a sign of a healthier fish population in the waters in the area? The seals eat a lot of fish. So I don't know if it's a sign of a healthier fish population or it's an attack on the fish population. And right. you will, if you get 10 fishermen, you'll get 10 opinions. Um, but you, the smaller seals we tend to see in and off Nantucket Sound uh, the harbor seals. You, you'll see them in the rivers, you'll see them in the estuaries, you'll see them out on the Nantucket. Uh, the larger gray seals usually see on the other side of uh, Monomoy and up and down the coast and around right. in, in Tucker Nut Bay. Right, yeah. and in large quantities. Um, another question, is there any seaweed being harvested in Nantucket Sound? I don't know. I don't know that either. Um, Okay, let me see. So, okay, with a herring count, are the counters looking for the jumping fish? Actually, what you're doing is you're looking to count the fish that goes over the top of the fish ladder. In uh, the particular fish ladder that we deal with, we actually lined the top of the fish ladder with whiteboard so that we could see when the herring went over that top of the fish ladder. Um, there is electronic counters now in some of the uh, herring runs, which obviously give you a 24 hour a day actual count. With the counting program, you're doing 10 minute windows uh, within an hour and a half period of time. And then they're extrapolating that by a formula to determine the size of the run. But they're also taking into account our observations. For example, one of the ones we deal with a lot has a fish pool at the base of the ladder where the herring tend to circle around in the fish pool and rest before going up the ladder. We observe and count approximately how many are in that pool, even though we didn't see them go up over the ladder, every one of them ended up in the pond. So uh, again, that's part of the consideration. Thank you. Um, Caroline is asking if you can discuss Albies. False albacore and bonito, they're both members of the tuna family. The bonito come into our area a little sooner than the false albacore, uh, but the albies, it's just about albie time now. And if you look at those things I referenced earlier, those weekly video reports and the uh, magazines that write weekly uh, and monthly, there's a lot of people that go after false albacore and bonito when they're here because they are so fast. They grab a very small or on average. Uh, so you can cast things quite a ways and uh, a lot of fun to catch. Albies are catch and release. They are not edible, but bonito are wonderful on the grill. Um, but again, they're all fun to get catch and release. Bob is saying, not a question, but a comment. On Monday afternoon, in about 20 minutes, I caught three different species on the Yarmouth Reef, black sea bass, scup, and a fluke. 
His only regret was that his five-year-old grandson was not on board. Exactly. So that's nice to, nice yep. to hear. I'm surprised um, he didn't also catch a sea robin. <laughs> but that's, you know, with the amount of structure now being enhanced, uh, we have in regular deployments from the Coast Guard. A year and a half ago, we were able to deploy those three barge loads of material. Something I did not say earlier is that uh, through the efforts of the Department of Transportation and the Division of Marine Fisheries, Mark Russo, we have four acres of granite at the state pier in New Bedford, ready for deployment. If somebody has $250,000 and wants to write a check, uh, we can get that deployed to greatly uh, enhance uh, the fishing reef and the attraction of sea life and what that reef can do. But as he reported, we have one of our members uh, this spring in May, he caught 99 fish in one trip on the, uh, on the tire reef site. Uh, he actually did catch and release with all of it, uh, but he with more. Uh, so doing process like this, you know, work with the, um, the federal government fundraising but we can. We now have material ready to deploy. We have no trucking cost. All came out of the South Coast Rail Project. Uh, and we're taking out over, taking out everything else. Uh, you're, you're kind of going in and out. I don't know if it's just me. I don't know if you're. No, I just, I just had something say it was an issue. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here, and. Um, I can hear you okay. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Hang on a minute. I'm just looking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, so I'm, I'm just. Fine. But anyway, the South Coast Rail Project, uh, everywhere they took down a bridge or a culvert or anything to put in the newer, higher speed rail, all the granite got dedicated to being uh, uh, artificial reefs, both in Nantucket Sound and on Cape Cod Bay. Okay. Um, we are coming up on seven, so I'm just going to do one or two more questions. Um, Tom asks, is there a herring run as far as Lake Wequocket? Yes, the Centerville herring run. And uh, was on Lake Wequocket. And actually, just as we speak, it's being sold in a few weeks. But uh, it was my grandfather's house. And the only reason I mention this is this uh, summer, the herring obviously come in via the Centerville. Uh, through Long Pond in Centerville and then up into Aquacket Lake, I witnessed the herring spawning right in front with grandkids to wow. watch and talk about it. And we wow. have seen herring fry there for my, you know, my whole adult life. Uh, so Aquacket Lake uh, is quite an area for herring activity right. coming and going to the ocean. So that's an important herring run. Okay. And then um, I'm just going to end this uh Q&A with um, a, another comment. It says, hi, not a question, but I'm new to the Cape. This comes from Peter, enjoying the Salties this summer. I found this presentation interesting and educational. The Patriots co coach, Bill Belichick would say, job well done. And we should post this recording at the Salties website. It will also be posted on our website at, um, at, our, at Save Our Sound. So um, with that, I just wanna thank you, Randall. I don't know if you have any any last thing you want to say before I before I wrap up, or if you're all set? Just that you know, Nantucket Sound is uh, obviously a large area, but it's an area where we have hundreds of thousands of people have access to it via all of our municipalities, by all of our rivers and estuaries, and boat ramps and what have you, shore fishing, boat fishing, commercial boat fishing, charter boats. Take advantage. You know, uh, it's a wonderful place. You know, watch your weather, be safe. Uh, learn Especially how to, this weekend. You know, join the Salties, learn how to fish, and uh, have a good time. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Randall. That was really informative and interesting, and I'm sure everyone in the audience agrees with me on that. So I want to um, thank you, and thanks to our audience for joining us tonight, and thanks to the Austral Anglers Club again for sponsoring uh, this webinar. I hope everyone has a deeper appreciation for Nantucket Sound. 
um, the fishing in the sound and why the legislation that our coalition is promoting is critical to protect this special place. So if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. You can reach out to me at audra at saveoursound.org and our organization's website is Save Our, Save Our Sound. Um, upcoming, we have a webinar on uh, September 30th and we're gonna be looking at birds in Nantucket Sound with Seth Engelberg of the Linda Loring Nature Foundation on Nantucket. And if you wanna register for that, you can visit our website, again, saveoursound.org slash ACONS, which again stands for a celebration of Nantucket Sound. If you want to help directly and um, to support, you put that back up, Peter, to support the um, Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act, the legislation I discussed in the beginning that would designate the sound as a landmark, improve consistency between state and federal law and provide a whole host of environmental protections. Um, you can donate at saveoursound.org or you can go on our website and there's uh, directions and information on how you can call or email your state and federal legislators to urge them to enact this important bill. So with that, again, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great night and hope to see you next month when we're looking at the birds of Nantucket Sound.